You're now listening to Cashed In. So today is episode 10 of Cashed In, and today we are joined with Justin Davis, who has many roles here in Pittsburgh. He is with All Pittsburgh Real Estate as an agent. He's an appraiser. He's involved with the Cystic Fibrosic Foundation. And Justin, I'm so glad you could join us today. I'm honored to be here. I've, I've watched them all. You guys are great, and I'm um, looking forward to it. So I love that. Awesome. And you're subscribed, so that's awesome. That's right. <laughs> subscribe. Thumbs up. Yes. So... Um, I want to start first as your role as an appraiser. So in the transaction, you can either be the villain or the hero. And That's how, because <laughs> the transaction essentially hinges on the appraisal most of the time when you're buying with a mortgage or if it's a sure. contingency with a cash deal. Um, does that ever play a role in your values? Uh, does not. Um, when I started, I started when it was the Wild West where, you know, it was, I worked through the the crash. Mm -hmm. you know? So I started, I had to get an apprenticeship somewhere. So I found this horrible chop shop that, you know, 14 assistants for one appraiser and he's doing 60 appraisals a day because wow. he has people on the road. It was, I mean, literally it was interviewed by the FBI eventually. Like this guy was terrible. But um, the way it was then, mortgage brokers w would work directly with the appraisers. So a broker or, you know, a loan officer could reach out and order the appraisal from the appraiser. So they were going where they knew that someone would hit their values. Mm -hmm. So they would put an estimated value on the order sheet. And what that was, was this is the number we need for this loan to work. Yeah. And anytime. So I was known in the office for never making that number <laughs> because it was just absurd. These numbers, I mean, they'd have a house in Wilkinsburg which you both, you know, know has a, a much lower median value and my opportunity guy, zone, opportunity zone. And, mm -hmm. um, my appraiser in the office would say, well, go get comps from point breeze. It's a half a mile away, a quarter of a mile away. And the reviewer in Michigan for this bank doesn't know. Mm. And I'm like, y what? Like, so eventually I wasn't welcome there anymore, Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but that's the way they were pumping them out. I mean, that's why that crash happened. So then you know, fast forward through the crash, they added the AMCs, the management companies. Mm -hmm. So there's a middle person now that orders the appraisals from the appraiser and there's no communication between the bank and the appraiser. So to answer your question in obviously the longest way possible, um, <laughs> the, the, the sales price used to be sort of a, a guideline at least. Yeah. It's like, you know, appraisal is an opinion. It's not an exact science. So I'm not good enough to say this sales price is 210 but I'm telling you it's only worth 207. That's mm -hmm. silly. Yeah. So I do like to know the sales price, but I'm certainly not influenced by it, you know, in that way. So, you know, in God lately, we've just been seeing there, there's actually less supply right now. I feel than there was even last year. Um, I feel that. Yeah, it's, absolutely. It's craziness. So appraisal, mm -hmm. uh, I, we've, we've been counting now. So out of the last 21 purchases we've done, we haven't come in at purchase price on 18 of them. Above or below? Below. Yeah. Below. 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 Wow, okay. Even so. with the demand. So does the, the demand add a value at all? Like not an adjusted all. value? So supply and demand does not take into consideration a sales comparison approach? Not at all. The bank doesn't want to say, well, it's a hot market right now. They want proof. Interesting. Okay. And what the problem is right now, we're working off of a six-month, maybe to a 12-month period of time. So they want to see sales from as recently as possible. Um, no further back than 12 months. So when I'm giving comparable sales in a in an appraisal report, this is March of 2022. I can't go beyond March of 2021 for sales. Well, if you you guys are both heavily in this game, you know that that mad rush that happened kind of, you know, thinned into less sales just because there was less inventory. Inventory. Yeah. yeah. Um, wow. So with those falling off now, I don't have... I've, I've got a place that had 15 offers or something like that, uh, listed at 395, sold for 460, or was under contract for 460. Listed at 395, I came in at 385. Mm. I didn't have a choice. Yeah, It was in C4 condition, which yeah. you guys know, but anybody listening, C4 condition is everything, all the cosmetics are sort of at the end of their economic life. It's dated, uh, livable, but dated, it's going to be in need of, you know, updating. Yeah. So I didn't have anything in C4 condition 
at, at that price point and mm-hmm. everything that was at that price point was you know 400 to 450 was all updated and perfect mm-hmm. you know new kitchens new bathrooms and money had been put into them and so i mean I, I hate to say we're killing deals but i mean what i do with my clients on the real estate side is i i warn them right up front this has to appraise we might get all these offers and we might get this number and it's fantastic it has to appraise if it doesn't appraise you know that that's the name of the game yeah so a, a lot of agents aren't warning their clients like that though and that's the problem and the harassment calls i get and the reconsiderations of value it's it's a whole other job just to review these new comps and you know this house is 1600 square foot and they're sending me 2500 square foot comps mm-hmm. it, it's not a comp right right yeah i i had a, my first experience with an appraiser was terrible you know so i actually to your point, now this was after the crash. It was actually in Ocean City, Maryland. Okay. It was the it was a it was a it was I think it was maybe one bed one bath condo. It was right on Coastal Highway, and the comps that they were using to justify it were beachfront condos. There were one bed one bath. I'm like, wait a second, you're justifying a higher purchase price based on the locate the locations aren't the same, right? So. I ended up pulling out of the deal because they were saying, okay, well, the price, I think it was like 130000 So they were saying that the value of the property was appraised at 130000 whereas I looked at the comps, I'm like, these aren't even remotely close to the same. The square footage isn't the same. And the main, I mean, the main issue for me was you're, you're justifying this based, based off of beachfront property, whereas this is facing the highway. So, <laughs> so you know, I mean, I didn't have the greatest experience, but, you know, um, besides that point, you know, as an investor, you know, uh, we buy properties, right? You know, we talk, you, you, I think we, you had said that you listened to the Burr method, you know, uh, yeah. episode that we had. So naturally, you know, a lot of viewers are taking that approach. It's one of the most popular strategies, Absolutely. you know, and I think we could all agree, you know, we all own, own property. We, you know, there's, we tend to want to believe that our properties are worth, you know, top uh, of the market, top of Premier, the market right? Yeah. It's the best. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's no, right. So how, what would you say you mentioned like C4 condition, right? You know, so as you're going through that Burr approach, you know, maybe get into, okay, how are you classifying these? What, what does C4 mean? What does C3 mean too? Sure. You know, so that from an investor, when you're in, you know, when you're going through that process and that planning, what is important in the eyes of an appraiser? Well, the advice I give, cause again, I'm on both sides of it. So I'm giving a perspective from the appraisal's perspective to my real estate clients. Um, First and foremost, you don't want to be the biggest and baddest on the block. Mm-hmm. You know, it, you, you, you have to kind of conform to your neighborhood. So, you, you know, C4 condition, like I, I was just telling you off camera about a, a place that we were appraising in Carrick that was a duplex. And it was just in horrible condition. But, you know, so that was in what I, we call C6 condition. So the ratings go C1 to C6 for appraisal purposes. That was something that they changed when they changed all the appraisal guidelines coming out of the crash. So C1 is new construction, ground Mm -hmm. up, brand new. C2 is a total gotten renovation to the point of new construction just on an existing dwelling. So that is, everything's perfect. Everything's completely redone. Down to the studs. Down to the the studs. Okay. So you're ripping, okay. I mean, wiring, HVAC. I mean, not necessarily, you know, like a new electric service. It may not call for that or there might be something that's completely, but all the cosmetics are new. All, everything to the naked eye is functions as a new construction dwelling mm-hmm. you know flooring walls ceiling you know so regardless flip, of the like age right regardless of age yeah mm-hmm. that that goes into effective age so you know you could have a 120 year old house which is super common in Pittsburgh. western pennsylvania yeah. sure. but the effective age is what matters and if you turn it into a c2 property it could be effectively five years old so Ooh, you know okay. facelift that's right. That's right. That's mm-hmm. Botox and Love it. injections and fillers and everything. <laughs> Filler and <laughs> but, um, but the, you know, the, the remaining economic life is, you know, what you're looking at there, how much time is left on all of these, mm. all of these cosmetics. So C2, that's your, that's your total gut and flip looks like brand new. C3 is your average, nothing needs updated. You can live in this right now and you don't have to do every, anything to it. You know, it might not be all brand new, everything, but it's just completely well-maintained, sparkling, you know, just a good, solid house. C4 is when it's it's very livable. It's very functional. Everything still works. Nothing's leaking or, but those cosmetics are coming to the end of their economic life. That, that 
you know, wallpapered kitchen is shag carpet. Yeah. yeah, that's not a, that's not the market Pink anymore. Bathroom. You know, yeah. yeah, right. And it might still even be really well maintained, but dated. And then C five is when you're starting to get in some trouble. Well, you know, you're you're having appliance issues. That roof has to be replaced. Those windows. There's some single pane windows still in here. They've got to go. And that's C five condition, which you see in a lot of these flips. That's that's primarily C five and C six. C six is damn near a knockdown. Yeah, this true. is on the border of, you know, unsafe. You know, okay. and and that's where you're getting some gems though for for somebody investors, like you, investors yeah. like both of you. Yeah, where you know you get this in C six condition and you can get it at a low price, but it's in a market that could call for a a rehab to C three or C two. Now you're talking, but like this one I did in Carrick, the only comp data was really C4 is your, the top of your market there. So knowing that C4 is the top of your rental market there and knowing that you're only going to command rents in C4 condition, is it worth going all out with all this HVAC and wiring? And, and you still have to do the same. Mm -hmm. The construction costs are still the same. And what are you going to pull? You're not going to do the same renovation there that you do in, say, Mount Washington mm -hmm. or Lawrenceville. Yeah. Because you could command crazy rents. But, you know, there, that's what I'm going back and forth with the bank. It's like it's so much harder to do your job well than if you were just to blindly put a number on something and give people what they want. But, um, you know, so then I have to go back and forth and explain myself eight times that, you know, Ugh. the top of the market here, you you may squeeze 900 and some dollars a month out of these renters. How much money is it worth putting into a place at that point? Yeah. Yeah. That was so. my next question actually for you because you could overdo it, you know, even though, even though you're in Carrick, I mean the, the house, the structure in and of itself, you might get it to C2 or C3, right? But in terms of what the value is in terms of the rents and what you're going to be able to get, you know, it's, it's never going to get above a C4 is what you're, is that what you're basically saying? Yeah. I mean, well, just, that's what the data is telling that's me. Right. There, you know, I don't have any data saying that you can do this subway tile and marble tile floors and, and, you know, crazy lighting and yeah. all that, like you would justify in some other parts of the city. I don't have any data to support that. That's, you know, the market's calling for that right now. Sure. So why would you do that? Why would you over improve it? Right. You wouldn't, and you're not going to return the same value. And, you know, it, it's funny because I, I have a background in contracting and obviously appraisal and, and just I try to be very well-rounded. This is all I've ever done in my entire life is real estate. So, but they, they put a lot of onus. We're the smallest fee in the whole thing, the transaction, the appraiser. And they put a lot, I mean, the, the whole thing, as you said, is it's weighted is, on you, is weighted on us. You can make or break it happen. We make or break it. And they put just even some of the stuff they ask us to do with pricing, Okay, so you said this, this, and this is wrong with this house. Give us an itemized list of what it would cost to repair that. Uh, You're, you want to <laughs> now, now? Fortunately, for my <laughs> clients, I do have that ability, but right. that's a crazy thing to ask yeah. an appraiser. And these banks are making a lending decision based on a real estate appraiser telling them how much it should cost to service the HVAC and put a new electric system. I think, come on. Yeah. Yeah. It's just. And these bananas. reports are sometimes like sixty pages, eighty oh. pages. They're intense. They're intense. And like I said, then when you don't give them, when I don't hit a purchase price mm -hmm. because it's just not supported by the data, that's when you really get into some intense back and forth. And I don't get paid anymore to have to explain myself two and three times. And I'm, I sympathize. I'm a real estate agent, you know, yeah. I've had mm -hmm. plenty of my listings go over asking price and I prepare every one of my, you know, sellers, like we might not get this, mm -hmm. you know, here's the comps, you yeah. know, so, you know, just preparing, but you get it. You know what real estate is. Yeah. Half the, I, I don't know about half, but at least a third of the agents in the game aren't real estate agents. They're people. That no, have they're a people who got license. bored and went on realestateexpress.com, took a test, and now they're out showing houses. It's. <laughs> I I always say this. <laughs> yeah. So for appraisal, when and it's even more stringent now. But when I was going to get you know qualified to become a real estate appraiser, we had to take just a boatload of appraisal courses. Mm -hmm. Great. Then you have to do a two-year minimum, 2,500-hour minimum apprenticeship. So you have to go find a licensed appraiser who – Wants to apprentice you. <laughs> right, because they're basically training their competition because yeah. eventually you're going to sure. get licensed. So no one's motivated to do that unless they have you know, some shady stuff going on, which is what I dealt with. I did not get paid. I had to go telemarket at night. But even in that terrible situation that I came from – 
I kind of learned backwards what not to do, which was great. But my point is 2,500 hours, 3,000 hours probably of that couple years. What's it take to get your real estate license? They just raise it to 75 hours. It used to be 60 in Pennsylvania. With no apprenticeship. Nope. That's my point. Yeah. So you can get your license. You can fluff your way through the test or take the test 10 times and finally get licensed. And now what? Coldwell Banker, Remax, any one of them, they need to pump numbers out. So yeah, they will you're just sign, a number. They're, hurt, they're, they're herding cattle at this point. They're herding cattle. Yeah. Like, there is no qualification except, do you have a license? Come on a board. Yeah. That's it. And, you know, then they're going on Zillow and they're going on Realtor.com and they're, they're buying zip codes and doing, you know, that level of marketing so that they can get a deal snagged. And what service are they provide? I mean, you have no idea what you're doing. How many deals have you had to carry both sides? Many. I mean, and they're, I can tell when they're new. You just know from experience and being in the game so long. I can tell when people are green, as sure. I call them. And I sympathize with them because they're trying to make a living. I mean, I was green at one point. And Same I embarrassed here. myself a million times, but I, there's a lot of them right now. When I was <laughs> green, though, I was willing to swallow my pride and say, Yes, I was never argumentative. I was never mm -hmm. like, well, my client wants this. I know this, and I know yeah. that. Like, I'm green in other states, and sure, I'm learning. Sure. And I have the utmost respect for agents who want to help me and give me um, you know, tips on what to do in those markets. So... I mean, I always have respect for the other person, but they it's its not really reciprocated sometimes here. That's the problem. That's yeah. exactly the point is. They think it's like a fight, and we're, we're kind of on the same team. Everyone wants to, someone wants to sell a house, someone wants to buy a house. We're not trying to, like, cut each other's throats. Right. We want we're to get team. to the closing table. We want to get to the closing table in the fairest, you know, most responsible way. So there's no need for us to, like, for me to call you. You're on the team, too, in a transaction. As an appraiser. So you and I have done a deal together. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, it was smooth sailing. Yeah. And that wasn't the easiest thing. It was a vacant house with problems and there was inspection issues and your client was out of town. And I mean, mm -hmm. for two stranger agents that might have been combative, that could have very easily fallen into oh. that difficult. Yeah. When things, when issues arise, as they usually do in older homes, older aged homes, you know, people, you have to have a certain sentiment and demeanor and candor when you're dealing with other people. And uh, in, in trying to make a deal happen, there's no need to be aggressive at all. In some of those newer agents, the problem is I think they want to fake it till they make it. Yes. And they watch all this Grant Cardone and all these people on YouTube and they want to be, you know, we've both and there. We know all the names of you know, the ones that are experienced that are like that. But the inexperienced, that that's my I, I wish there was some type of apprenticeship program like there is for appraisal. Just there should be because you're the um, required education for you to get a license is insane. Oh, it's, it's even crazier now. It's cr insane. Because I've thought, we've talked about it. I was like, yeah. maybe I should be an appraiser. And you're like, well, you, you better be ready to do 2,500 hours of this. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, That's my God, I don't have time for that. <laughs> it's it's nuts. And I just think that even a year of, you know, a, a, a really being taken under someone's wing and, and watching a couple deals fall apart and a couple deals on the on the edge and had to change. And after inspections, this was revealed. And now we we, we have to renegotiate. Just to experience that, on, not on the fly in your own deal, but to be underneath someone's wing. Like, you're you're a gift to your team because you have these young up-and-coming realtors that you, you do take under your wing. And mm -hmm. that, that is so important because if they just signed on with a Howard Hanna or a Coldwell or somebody, there are some good training programs. You can sit in classes, but you don't. Experience is the best teacher. Experience is it. It's the yeah. best teacher. And you and I are still learning every day, all three Absolutely. of us. Absolutely. I'm a student. Absolutely. And I get told that. <laughs> by the people who have been in the game 35 years. There's also the older ones that aren't very nice. <laughs> like, I've been doing this 35 years. I'm like, well, don't send me a fax then. How about just an email? <laughs> just, fax. Yeah. I, I forget which, which one of your, I, w one of your podcasts that I watched, uh, you guys both had, had a discussion. It was just the two of you about having a team. And just what you said, I have sort of two teams. I have like my team of, of collaborators, w that being like title and mortgage, mm -hmm. and just I, I know that this commercial mortgage guy gets this done for a hybrid SBA commercial loan, but I know that this residential guy can get a rehab loan done for a project where it's very plug and play and you know, just different teammates. But then I have my other team of guys, which you had met Anthony DePredis last night. Yeah, he was cool. And Anthony's, you know, it, so these are sort of mentor people that I have that, um, are above me and I just think that's also so vital to have you're on your my life. team too I call you when I need appraisals we, done yeah we yeah I'm, I'm 
happily and gladly part of your team. But yeah, mm -hmm. that that's that's that collaboration. But like an Anthony DePretis, this guy, there are only X amount of minds. It, just what his experience is, you can't. He's, he he worked for NVR Ryan Holmes for thirty four years. You're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars, probably a billion dollars of transactions, yeah. development, finding pieces of land 10 years before they project to develop them and have them in the communities. Just that experience is crazy. And then he's developing things on his own, doing million dollar houses. He's like my safety net. Thank God he, he took me under his wing, but this, he like, he won't let me fail. Same with Zach Phages, who's another teammate who is- Who I met, he's awesome. Yeah, yep. property manager and he owns, he, he manages a couple thousand doors, a couple million square feet of commercial space. And then he owns 200 and some units, but he's another one that Anthony, you know, watches out for. And um, that's so those that team is, you know, who I try to level up to, because as you guys talked about in that particular podcast, you know, you, you want to always be chasing that next level. Mm -hmm. And that's I think that's where we're all at. But, yeah, the appraisal side. It's, it's just funny because we're the lowest on the totem pole and we get all the pressure, all the harassment. So I've had a couple weird experiences I wanted to bring up with appraise, appraisals. And um, they're not weird, but it's just, I guess, uh, more difficult transactions. Uh, so I just, I sold my first house in Florida. Okay, super excited. Yeah, congrats, you know? I saw that. Well, it's not happening. Oh. <laughs> Wait, what? It's not happening. You because heard it here I first, didn't even know. folks. Yeah, I didn't even it's know. It's because of the appraisal. And, uh, and, uh, and it protected my buyer. Because I hate to call it a deal killer, but I pulled comps and we could not justify the value. So she came in, we made an offer at list price, which was 650000 And it was a property that was in an unincorporated neighborhood where you could do short-term rentals near the St. Petersburg area. Um, she was buying it with the intention of it to be an Airbnb. So we get the appraisal back and it appraised at 506000 That's significant. What was, what was the list price? 650. 650 was so, the list price, and what did you have it under agreement for? 650. So at asking. At asking, yeah, because it was competitive. What did it sell for before that? that did you see like the most recent? Uh, I believe it was 275,000. When? Mm, probably so a, year a, so Wait, a year or so ago. Wait, a year ago? It was a, They bought it as oh, a flip. Oh, they bought it as a flip. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So they put some significant <laughs> work into it. That happens down there. Yeah. It's unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you have a two bed, two bath condo that's over three fifty. Now they're getting six fifty. Yeah, well, or at least they think they're yeah. going to get six fifty. So um, it yeah, was it's... beautiful. I mean, it was gorgeous, and she was so excited. Her furniture was being delivered. You know, April first, we were closing March thirty first, and that appraisal came in. And I said to her, and she's one of my good friends in the industry. I said, you know it. it there's a reason this happened and we couldn't find anything else to compare to the seller was giving the seller agent was giving us comps that was like waterfront right, gated same. communities <laughs> boat yeah. docks and i'm like this is not that the seller wouldn't budge there's then. no pool here you know what i mean like so the seller wouldn't budge and i guess this seller i never met the seller but the way the agent described it was he owned over a thousand properties it was like a huge thing and she's like well if she's not going to pay asking then we're just going to rent it i'm like all right Oh, so it, they're not, uh, they're going to take it off put, the market. Or put it back on the market, get a cash buy or rent it. Yeah, they didn't even cash, care. Yeah. It was, yeah, it was like another day in, in paradise for them. They're like, whatever. So, oh, that's but on the buyer side, you know, it's like such a disappointment. And it's like, uh, there's a, re I told her, I was like, there's a reason. She's like, I believe it too. There's always a reason we'll find something else. So it's, it's just, I give that speech a lot, but it is like you end up finding something better or it protected you from paying. Prote that is protection. It yeah, really is. it that's is just, protection. Absolutely. I, I tell every one of my buyers if the appraisal doesn't come in, you are so lucky yeah. because there are appraisers out mm -hmm. there that just hit the number. Yep. Oh and, yeah. And they'll find a way like you talked about with Ocean City. It just did it again a month ago. I was I was under contract. Uh I think the property was uh, they wanted 495. I think I came in at 505. The appraisal came in at uh, 350. And I'm like they wouldn't budge. He goes, mm -hmm. "No, I'll, I'll, we'll wait for a cash we'll wait for a cash buyer." I'm like, "Okay, there's a 50 nearly a $50,000 gap there." Yeah. Not as much as yours. Yeah. Goes back onto the market. And it goes, it goes, uh, it goes contingent again, and they got conventional financing. An appraiser hit the mark. Yeah, like, see, that's that what is I've been the sketchiest part about. Yep, that's why FHA I, huh. appraisers are different than conventional appraisal, appraisers in my mind, in my experience. If it's an FHA buyer, I'm like, this isn't going to hit. But if you go conventional, we're going to make this number. Well, I was conventional too. Yeah, yeah they were both conventional. Yeah, it was yeah. just. That market down in this good. market. Oh, I mean, yeah. I a, yeah. And then um, another story I wanted to bring up really quickly. I flipped a house and the appraiser, the buyer's appraiser, it was VA. And um, 
he had a vengeance for flippers. He hated people who mm-hmm. came into the neighborhood, bought the the property for profit, you know, flipped it. I, you know, this thing was top to bottom, new roof, windows, HVAC, everything. It was, you know, we did it right. And he came in, we were asking 150, I'm sorry, we were asking 160 and he came in at 125. I had comps to justify it. The other agent, the buyer's agent was like, I have comps to justify it too. We sent it to him. And his whole thing was, I'm protecting that veteran. He's going to be underwater in two years. I don't like these people coming in and flipping houses and the agents, the, the flipper. And I'm like, okay. So this, this veteran called the VA and said, I want this house. You know, I believe it's justified. We have comps. But this guy who, the appraiser who was so emotionally charged with protecting this veteran made him homeless because he didn't have a house so yeah. unfortunately we had to terminate because i would i'd be underwater if i sold it at 125 so i put it back on the market and i got a cash offer that week for list 160 that i hate hearing stories like that because that is the influence that you're not supposed to take into consider it you're supposed to go in with a blank my like you asked me both of you asked me if the if the sales price influences and it, it doesn't influence my final value, but again, it, it, it is a, it, some people use it as a guideline. Sure. But to say you're protecting somebody from something to get into their personal, I mean, that is not your job. He said that flat out that he did not like flippers. I mean, that's a the... violation. You, know. <laughs> yeah, you would think. I got yeah. his name. <laughs> <laughs> I, th- you know, that is not something that's supposed to come into play. And, and then now you're, you are being influenced by something and that, yeah, there's, there's, there's some ridiculous people. Some of the, you know, I've I've been in appraisal for 19 years now, and um, you know we're I'm still one of the younger people in appraisal. Like it's very difficult to get into appraisal, and some of the old guard is still you know they're they're kind of falling off and they're tiring. But man, they're going kicking and screaming. I I, I hate to stereotype like that, but a, a lot of the same kind of mindset would like I'm not the, these values are going up too high. You know if the data is there to support it. Mm -hmm. that's it yeah it was a very sad situation they tried to rent it from us they wanted to be they saw themselves living there and people get an emotional attachment to houses that they're buying it's an emotional i mean it was it was almost devastating that we had to break i wanted to sell it to him but i i couldn't afford to sell it to him you know what i mean it was sad but in in the future um you can ask for a formal value reconsideration and you can actually you'd have to pay for it Mm -hmm. but you can ask for another i mean that circumstance it's completely reasonable to go to the lender and say this guy is bringing i mean i I don't even understand what he's saying with having an emotional connection to this buyer and trying to protect that's not his job his job is to appraise the day he inspects the property Mm -hmm. using the data that is the best most suitable replacements for the subject property. Mm-hmm. That's it. Yeah. So it would be really reasonable in that instance to ask for another appraisal. Yeah. But, you know, stories like that, I mean, that you're not protecting the buyer. You're just, you know, sitting on a pulpit thinking you're, you know, some higher yeah. figure. The That's dark night of Newcastle. Right. <laughs> the dark night of Newcastle. <laughs> so, so I, I do have one more question for you from the eyes of an investor. Okay. You mentioned the different areas, different, you know, classifications for the properties, right? So what do you take into account? You're in a good area, right? So, so we'll, we'll use Bellevue, okay? Do you take into account, uh, like, what matters most, like, in terms of, like, so say you get a vanity. You get a regular $250 stock vanity, or you get five, six, seven or $700 vanity. The, the, the flooring, do you take into account? I mean, you could kind of tell better flooring from cheap stuff. You know, cabinets, does that matter? Light fixture. I mean, what what matters or does it all matter in the grand scheme of things? Here's what I'll say. You you obviously have a great partner with, mm-hmm. with Anna here. Um, you want to have that. And Anna calls me sometimes for, you know, just a second set of eyes. Mm-hmm. I call her for things. Um, but what you really want to do as an investor is to have a great partner like that to – do a true comp search, a true mm. as repaired. What 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 is on the market in these last twelve months? You know that is has been updated. Are there things that have been blown out with, you know, granite and or quartz and in dentured crown molding and mm. you know all those little extras? Or is it more of a Home Depot? But the comps are going to tell you that. You know, I mean, okay. there's no there's no especially with fair housing. There's no good area, bad area. We don't, right. You know, all we do 
you know, when, when I, my investors, you know, I have my investors that I send properties to and, um, and for the as repaired value, I take a radius. I start with a quarter mile radius around the property in the same school district, in the same neighborhood, just those blocks and see what's been turned over and flipped quote unquote or updated. And then I go, you know, I expand as far as reasonable, you know, some areas are less dense, so there's less, less data. But, you know, in the Brookline, Carrick, you know, the, those city areas where there's just a ton of density and a ton of projects. I mean, you'll see, you'll see the, the data will tell you if you do that quartz and that pendant lights and all the nice, beautiful vanities and all those things, you know, it might take you another 40 you grand over. Yeah. But it might only take you another 15 grand over. No, Is that worth really, it? Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. but it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's truly case by case. Driven. Yeah case by case and you have to get a good partner as an investor that can really some of these agents are just mailing it in you see the comps that agents will send for you know oh here's why this purchase is worth it well no it's not and that's not a comparable you you, you said they had comparable in that ocean city they didn't have comparable they had sales right those mm -hmm. aren't those aren't comparable that's not comparable data you need a great partner an appraiser or a really in, intuitive agent who will really give you comparable data and you have to take it from the, I, I get more and more requests for private appraisals now because what better way to figure out what the bank's going to say a house is worth than the guy that's going to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know absolutely. I mean? So we, we've been getting bombarded with that stuff. And it, like Kevin Mim, there was a point when I worked for Rob Scheppner when I, I wasn't um, full-time appraising. And he, he every single mm -hmm. listing that he got, and Kevin Mim did volume, does mm -hmm. volume, Every single one, the first step as part of his marketing package was, and we have Rob Scheppner and his guy come out and they appraise it. Mm -hmm. That was his first step. Mm. So whatever this is, that's what our listing price is going to be right around that. And that was the confidence he had in us. But I mean, like you said, what, what level of, what level was the market call for? You don't want to go nuts, but you don't want to underdo it. I mean, yeah. you have the, some really cool stuff now with like luxury vinyl plank and stuff that looks beautiful and can be mm -hmm. cost effective. And people love to see that, but you know, little slabs of granite and stuff like that, they can all make all the difference in the world, but you don't want to do the 8,000 if you could do the 2,200, you yeah. you know? Yep. So absolutely. Awesome. Yeah. Well, um, thank you, Justin, for coming in today. Thanks for having thank you. And then when can we, uh, see your project that's going to be done in Mount Washington? Well, I'm going to have renderings for you probably by the middle of next week. And it has a view, right? It has an unobstructed view of the city skyline. Wow. It's uh, directly below the Smart House, if people are familiar yes. with the Smart House on uh -huh. Bailey. I, I mean, that's at the top of the hill right below us. We're the last street before the hillside just goes down to essentially Station Square. Yeah. So I can't uh, wait to see that. It's going to be great. Elevator in place. We have four lots, too. So th we're going to build this one as a spec, but we can build four total. Oh, my God. Right. I can't wait to see it. It's I can't wait to show it to you. Yeah. You'll be the first, believe me. Woo! <laughs> well, thank you, Justin, for coming in, and thank you for watching episode 10 of Cashed In.